Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, Little Bird number five, the thrilling stunning, supremely satisfying conclusion to the Little Bird Saga. This book has come and it has just blown me away this year. Every single issue, it's in a very imaginative story. It's a very thematically relevant and resonant story. Darcy Van Polgies, Ian Bertram, Matt Hollingsworth, Aditya Bidikar and company, they have done an absolutely splendid job, an expert job with this book, and they have completely nailed that ending. Great ending, very satisfying conclusion to the tale. It brings all the different plot threads, all the different character stories, all the different thematic ideas. It brings it all together and ties it up in one nice neat little bow, but it's also got some really exciting kind of things lurking inside of it. Anyway, I really like this one. The artwork by Bertram is absolutely fantastic. Colors by Hollingsworth. The story, the script, the, the, the relevancy of the story, the urgency with which it's told by the creative team is absolutely splendid. Like I said, some of the best lettering in the business, some of the best coloring, some of the best artwork, and some of the best writing is in the pages of Little Bird. This right now, for me, we're like, you know, a little over halfway through 2019. This is my favorite comic book of the year so far. Each issue just kept building on what came before, building it up subtly, slowly, but to maximum effect. That maximum effect is here with issue number five, an explosive, giant, dramatic, and thrilling conclusion to Little Bird. And there's some exciting news that lurks in the pages of Little Bird number five. So that's the pick of the week, Little Bird number five. What do you think about Little Bird? If you've been reading it, let me know in the comments down below. If you haven't been reading it, why not? Let me point out some vault titles that are out this week. You definitely want to check out Sarah and the Royal Stars, number one, first of all. It's like a high fantasy book. It takes influence from Middle Eastern and, and Eastern mythology. Um, really great stuff. Great world building. Excellent character introductions. Great artwork. This is written by John Sway with artwork by Audrey Mock. The artwork is like a perfect blending of like a manga style and an American comic book style. The story takes its inspiration from Asia and from the Middle East, of course, but it really makes something new out of it, something unique, something with its own voice that speaks a lot. Sarah and the Royal Stars was really great. I did an advanced review of this one. Check out that video if you want more information about this book, but I highly encourage you to check it out. Also, as Vault is prone to do, these issue number ones have these Vault vintage homage covers. The first one up for Sarah and the Royal Stars homages their own Heathen number one, so that's really, really cool. The other one references Adventure Comics 381, which was Supergirl's first featured solo um, story in a comic book. So, two really cool Vault vintage covers right there. Heck, just buy all three of them. Sarah and the Royal Stars is out this week, also from Vault this week, Resonant number one. This book was crazy. Written by David Andre, artwork by Alejandro Aragon, Jason Wordy, Darren Bennett rounding out that creative team. The artwork is excellent. It's got a nice gritty texture to it. Texture is also provided by those colors and even the lettering, and it adds a lot of texture to the story that uh, Andre has set up. Great stuff. Post-apocalyptic. Walking Dead is done. If you want a new post-apocalyptic book to fill that void, there's quite a few selections out there, but The Resonant, absolutely something I would highly recommend. I think this one's thrilling. I think it's really shocking, and it's very effectual with the way that the story unravels itself and how the artwork kind of works. And every single member of this team is totally effectual at bringing the effect of Resonant out. Great stuff from Vault Comics. Also, it has its own Vault Vintage Why the Last Man tribute cover, so that's really, really cool. You want to get in on that. I also did an advanced review of Resonant number one. So if you want a little bit more information about the story and what I thought about it, check out that advanced review on the channel. Speaking of advanced reviews, I got a copy of Maul number one. This one comes out, I think, at the end of August. It's by Michael Morisi, Gary Doberman, I believe. It's really, really cool. It's about this post-apocalyptic world that exists within a mall. So think that it's like Dawn of the Dead, but years later, without the zombies. Really great stuff. I had a lot of fun reading this one, so thank Everybody at Vault. This is going to be on sale, I believe, at the Vault booth at CD, uh, SDCC, I should say, this week. So if you get a chance to snag a copy, you definitely need to. It's going to be in some comic book shops, maybe, just maybe, if you're lucky enough. But it has the first full issue of the mall. It's really cool. It's also got a 10-page black and white preview of the plot, which is a new Michael Morisi, Tim Miller comic book coming from Vault that's going to be very, very unabashedly horror. Very excited for that. The mall, though, 
Really cool, looking forward to that. Get those pre-orders in right now. Let's continue down the indie trail, right? Let's just do it. Ghost Tree number four arrives this week from IDW Publishing. This is the final issue of Ghost Tree. Another one of the best books of the year. I love this book. It's a very subtle story about a dude running away from his problems, right? And he runs all the way back home to Japan and he finds this ancestral home. There's this tree and, then, and that all these ghosts are brought to him. Him and his grandfather before him, they can see these ghosts. And it's basically about running back to your past, to your memories. What is memory? The persistence of memory, as I like to say, or as Carl Sagan and others would like to say. Anyway, but Ghost Tree number four was a really nice wrap up. Very nuanced, very subtle story with really great artwork, great stuff by Simon Gain, Bobby Kernow, doing a great job with the story. I had so much fun with Ghost Tree. Four issues, and it's like short, sweet, but nothing is wasted. Everything is just, it strikes those right chords. It really is one of those lump in your throat type books at time. Um, very satisfying ending, but not, but also an uneasy ending, I should say. Ghost Tree number four is out this week. Also from IDW, Road of Bones number three. This book is survival horror at its finest. This is great stuff. This is probably definitely the most brutal, the most raw, and the most horrific issue of Road of Bones yet, which is basically about these three prisoners who have escaped a gulag in 50s um, Soviet Union out in the wilderness run out of food, what's going to happen. Obviously, they start maybe turning a little bit against each other, but it's excellently done. Rich Dubek, uh, Dubek, Rich Dubek, the writer, does a great job of building up this tension of the dialogue, the way they flow back and forth. It's really very effectual for basically a book that for the most part, three dudes walking through the wilderness, it's really, really engaging and very thrilling and it just filled with that anticipation about what's going to come on the next page. And Alex Cormack, does totally delivers on the next page at every page turn. Each page is just better, more grotesque, more brutal. Like I said, the artwork is gorgeous. I love this book. I think it's fantastic. Road of Bones number three is out this week from the same creator, writer of Road of Bones, Rich Duick. We've got Wailing Blade number two with artwork by Joe Mulvey. Um, and we also got Chris Sotomayor and Taylor Esposito rounding out that creative team. Wailing Blade is from Comics Tribe. This one's fun. It's about this dude in this world. So it's like kind of like post-apocalyptic, right? We've reverted back to a middle, like a like a dark ages type thing. But all these sci uber scientific high-tech re uh, relics of the past still exist, including the Wailing Blade, right? So it's about the, the head taker, I believe is his name. Is it the head taker? Yes, the head taker. Um, and it's about the people trying to... This book is wild. It's cool. It's fantasy. It's like really brutal, very violent. And it's got that tinge of science fiction to it that's really, really just makes it unique, makes it splendid. It's out there. It's boisterous. It's just so much fun. Excessively violent and gory and just perfection as far as that goes. Wailing Blade number two is out this week from Image Comics. Gideon Falls number 15 is here and whenever a new issue of Gideon Falls shows up it's going to be a new comic book day to remember. This has been a fantastic new comic book day. I think you're gonna have a lot of fun in the shops this week. Gideon Falls number 15, Jeff Lemire, um, Jeff Lemire, Andrea Sorrentino, Dave Stewart just doing the job that they've been doing, setting up of mystery, doing some really bold, striking, and effective horror in comic books. I don't know if I've ever read a comic book that's as effective at horror and even jump scares, I would dare to say, than Gideon Falls. This book is chilling. It's got such a tone to it. It's provided by that artwork. It's moody. It's atmospheric. It gets in your head, which is exactly what it's trying to do. Great stuff. This is a not a confusing issue, but it's an issue that poses more questions than it does answers, but that's what this book's been doing. Jeff Lemire is great at taking this mystery and just keeping it threaded and working it through and revealing bits in here and there, and this book has not gone in the direction whatsoever that I thought it was going to go into. Jeff Lemire doing fantastic work. Sorrentino, Stewart, the rest of the team, absolutely solid. Gideon Falls, number 15. Another chilling, ethereal chapter. Sonata number two, that's the second issue of this book that kind of took us by surprise. A lot of people really liked it, including myself. It's a cool fantasy book about these two um, warring nations with one other race caught in the middle, trying to try, just trying to claim a world for their own, but it's really imaginative. It's got some really great concepts in it. The artwork um, with the use of a lot of digital rendering in other hands would really come across stilted and just kind of stagnant, but Brian Haberlin does a fantastic job with this one, also with David Hine on the story. But the artwork just feels really, really, I don't know. It doesn't, 
It doesn't, I guess, cross that uncanny. I guess, I don't know. It's really, really good. And I like it. And it's something that I don't typically like in comic books because I do think it feels a little stiff, a little stagnant. Um, but this actually has a nice energy to it, a nice flow, and it's beautifully rendered and elegant to look at. Elegant to look at? Anyway, Assassination number five is out this week. This is the final issue of the Kyle Starks, Erica Henderson book that has just been a wild, violently fun romp. Um, seriously, it's been great. Basically, this dude hires the best assassins in the world to protect him because someone's put a hit out on him, and... It just all goes haywire from there. There's lots of death, lots of murder, lots of mayhem. This book has been so much fun. This is the final issue, dot, 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 for now, dot, 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 we hope. I would really like to see this book come back. It's kind of got a little setup as to things that could possibly come. So I hope Assassination comes back because this book has been fun and just, 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 just fun. This book has been awesome. Assassination number five out this week. Mary Shelley, Monster Hunter number four. This book from Aftershock Comics keeps getting better and better. Written by Adam Glass and Olivia Cartero Briggs and with artwork by Hayden Sherman. The artwork is what I would totally say is the spotlight, at least for me. Striking colors, great composition, truly atmospheric, great effective use of angles and restricted, restricted, uh, I almost said movement, but not movement. I, I would say restricted camera movement in a way, but like just you're not quite able to get a right perspective so it gets very chilling and atmospheric in its tone. The artwork is fantastic, but the story has gotten better and better and better. It's basically a retelling of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but it actually places it based in real events that she, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, and others experienced, and then she later wrote about. Very effective, really cool. Fans of the old school book, you're really going to like this. It's a new spin on the tale of Frankenstein, but it's also very effective, modernized, hip, but still reverent to what came before. I absolutely love this book. Mary Shelley, Monster Hunter, number four out this week. From Titan Comics, Blade Runner 2019, number one. So what this is, is that it is comic, it's a comic book that's gonna tell stories, at least a story, set in the world of the original Blade Runner movie. So that seems really cool, right? Blade Runner is one of my absolute favorite movies of all time. So I read this, very excited. It's all right. It's all right. There's nothing new about it. It just feels like repetition of what we've already seen in one movie. And of course, they did another one, um, 2049, of course. But 2019, it's all right. But it's kind of just retread some ground of the original Blade Runner movie. It really counts on that nostalgia factor. But I'd rather just watch Blade Runner. And that's kind of what I thought while I was reading this. But I know a lot of people are going to be on that art germ cover, I guess. The colors are cool. It does a great job of representing the world of Blade Runner. But nothing really brought me into it. I don't know. From Dark Horse Comics, we get a one-shot, The Quiet Kind. This one's written by Chuck Brown with artwork by Jeremy Treese and Kelly Williams. Two little stories in here. Um, it's all right. It's decent. It's a one-shot, so it's kind of long. It was really hard, especially in this big stack, to get into. I definitely think that maybe I need to come back to it later, uh, just like a single read kind of night, and read through it a little bit more patiently. But it just couldn't, it just never really hooked me. I made it through, but it kind of at times just... It just didn't really ever quite get me. I felt a little lost, a little thrown into the middle of something. It's just a one-shot. I felt like maybe there was something that came before. I don't think so. If there was, I missed it. But I just felt like I was missing something the entire time I was reading this book. So that's what I thought about that one. From DC, DC Young Animal. This DC Young Animal's back. We got Doom Patrol back. Why not another book? It's Mikey Way. That's right. Gerard Way's brother is taking his stab at writing a DC Young Animal book with Collapser. Collapser number one is really cool. If you like DC Young Animal, if you like what came before, if you like that old school 90s Vertigo vibe, you're totally going to dig on Collapser. It's basically about a dude who inherits the powers of a black hole. That's pretty rad, right? But it's also really about this dude and his self-defeating thoughts, his depression in life, his inability to, to, to get away from, I guess, the black hole of his own, you know, just, just self-deprecating everything, right? His own depression, his own sink, right? So it's kind of cool, the thematic tie-in there with the powers of a black hole, when he himself maybe is portrayed as just being a little bit more like that to himself and maybe around others. I really like this book. An interesting character, great artistic style. The art by Sean Simon is really, really cool. It gets wonky when it needs to be, classic when it needs to be. The dialogue is spot on. Mikey Way knows how to write a comic book. He knows how to write a comic book. And Sean Simon is the co-writer, my bad. Elias Cryasis. I messed that up. That's the artist. Art is great. Story's really cool. A great new book. Like I said, if you like that old school Vertigo stuff, if you like DC Young Animal, if you like Mikey Way, check it out. 
pretty good. Another book you really should check out, Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen, number one. Matt Fraction is just having so much fun with this. Matt Fraction, Steve Lieber, um, really, really fun book. It does reference a lot of the feel of a classic Jimmy Olsen type book. It's a book that, and this is what Matt Fraction told me at Heroes Con, that does not takes it, it does not take itself too seriously, but that doesn't mean it's not a serious book. Jimmy Olsen is always someone who I've never really liked that much in anything, whether it was television, animation, comic books. I've never really been a, a Jimmy Olsen fan. This is fun. This is taking that the annoying things about Jimmy Olsen, but just just twerking just 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 tweaking it just a little bit to make it fun, slightly irreverent, at least to the established mode of making a comic book. This is this book, I don't even know how to explain it. That's how great this book is. It's humorous. It's fun. It's got a lot of action to it. It's quirky. It makes some great little side gags there and here and there, but it's not... There is a serious thread that lies through it, and I've also taken a look at some issues 2 stuff and issue 3 stuff, and Fraction's got some cool plans for here. It's bold. It's big, and I, I just... I'm not trying to oversell this book. This book was really something special. I really like Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. It's bonkers. It's funny. It just had me laughing. And, and it had me really engaged and, and interested in the character of Jimmy Olsen. Or at least his world, I should say. But it, you can tell Fraction and Lieber, uh, Lieber and company are having a lot of fun with that book. I had a lot of fun reading it. Justice League number 28 is here. And this wraps up this whole, what did they call it? The Apex Predator story. So Jeff, um, Jeff, James Tynion has come in and he's doing these last three issues, right? Before Snyder comes in and does something else. I've loved Justice League. If you watch the videos, you are, you know, that's not a strange thought coming from me. So all that's been built up with, with Lex Luthor, he now makes his offer in this issue to Marshy Manhunter. And the results of all that is really cool stuff. I'm having so much with what's going on. Even when Scott Snyder takes a step back to let James Tiny come in and do some of the heavy lifting for him on these very exposition heavy, explainy type issues, Tiny and does that like with so much efficiency. This book is great. It's basically a conversation between Luther and John Jones and it absolutely works. It hits and it has a moment at the end where once again, Tinian and company have made the Justice League in this ongoing story with the Doom and Legion of Doom and the Justice League and the, the, you know, the, the, the war coming up, the year of the villain, dire big things it now feels once again like a no-win situation also of course you got the Justice League running around with a monitor and, and his brother looking for their brother the Andy monitor and that's pretty cool stuff too leading into some big things these are just precursor issues calm before the storm and it's odd to say that because lots of stuff happens here big stuff you don't want to miss it for sure Batman 75 is out this week this kicks off City of Bane it's a big extra sized issue it also has a cardstock year of the villain cover it's a dollar more for $5.99 but for $4.99 you can just get the regular one it is big it's got a lot of story to it it is Tom King though so that story kind of flies by real quick but what is City of Bane well Bane's broken Batman what's next maybe taking over Gotham does it happen I don't know Read this comic book and find out. I've really been liking Tom King's Batman. I know a lot of people are up and down on it. Some people just flat out don't like it. I've been up and down on it as well. But I'm liking this issue. I like what he's set up. I like what's going on. Some things are a little how, when, when, what. But a lot gets explained in this issue. And it's a nice fun setup to a spiritual successor to Nightfall. So I've been enjoying Tom King's Batman. This has got some great artwork by Mitch Garrods and mostly by Tony Daniel. Pumping out some really top notch artwork. Um, really cool stuff. Lots of Batman villains appear and it's pretty cool what Bane's plan is and what he's been doing and how it ties into Lex Luthor's offer. I really like it. So that's kind of a big deal. So check that out. Aquaman number 50 is here. I did opt for the cardstock extra dollar $5.99 because it's super sized issue, right? But it's got a year of the villain Black Mana cover. Black Mana is just the best. He's the coolest. Kelly Sue deconic has been really nailing Aquaman. Doing a great job. So now Arthur is back announcing back to the world that Aquaman is back. So Kelly now, after kind of reestablishing a little bit about Aquaman and his very deep connection to the ocean, um, is now bringing him back to land and kind of tying him back into Amnesty Bay while revealing what's going on with Mira over in Atlantis. So it's bringing the focus back onto where we're used to with total respect for what's come before and what she's already built up. That's kind of a different and new, de uh, new depth of dimension to the character of Arthur. Really like this stuff and it does, as the cover promises, bring back Black Mana in a very, very 
awesome moment towards the end. Um, lots of melodrama involving uh, Mira and, uh, and, and, and the whole situation with her having a baby and all that kind of stuff. Aside from that, um, and it wasn't bad, just a little, a little too silly at times. This book's really fun. I think Kelly Sue DeConnick. I think Aquaman's in great hands with her. Wonder Woman, come back to me. This is going to be just like Batman Universe and Superman up in the sky. This is going to collect those Wonder Woman Walmart exclusive stories. And this one, of course, by Jimmy Palamati and Amanda Connor and Chad Harden. So creators of the very, very effective um, DC New, was it New 52 and Rebirth, right? Uh, they did Harley Quinn, right? Very effective. So if you like that work, you should totally check it out. I've never really been that big of a fan of those cats when they get together and do their stuff. It's all right. This story is okay. Not the strongest Wonder Woman story. I would highly recommend picking up George Perez stuff or Greg Rucka stuff is what I would recommend over this. However, if you just can't get enough Wonder Woman, check it out. It's a fun little story. It's decent, right? Let's jump over to Marvel. Loki number one is out this week, written by Daniel Kibblesmith, with some decent artwork as well by dun -dun 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 -dun, Oscar Basaldua. Anyway, the artwork is really solid. The story is all right. It's okay. It's a Loki's. This is more like when Loki has solo stuff, it starts getting on my nerves. Like I didn't. Loki, yeah, new Loki, like post-MCU Loki, now that we got like the Hiddleston Loki here, basically. Um, he gets annoying to me when he's just the spotlight. So this is a little too snarky, a little too on the... I don't know. It's just I didn't like this book. It just... It's okay. It's okay, but... Okay. If you're interested in what Loki's going to do, now that he is the king of Jotunheim, definitely check it out. But it's okay. It's okay. Silver Surfer Black number two is out though, and this one is Cosmic Wild Bonkers Fun. This one's great, really cool stuff. So, as we know, Donny Case is writing this one, so of course he's got to tie it into the whole Null, the, you know, the symbiote god. He's got to tie it into that, so he does. Um, Silver Surfer lost and flung through a black hole, goes, wind up, us up, winds up far in the past, fighting Null. It's got some really cool bonkers type stuff in here. Tradmore's artwork is such an inspiration to look at. It's so crazy wild imaginative cool bonkers off the wall cosmic goodness right in the vein of kirby if kirby was at the prime at his peak making comic books today it would look something like this i think absolutely crazy cool stuff donny cates trad more totally respect everything that came before about this character but they're doing something new they're doing something different and it's actually very cool setups to stories that could flourish into something even bigger absolutely silver surfer black number two Loved it. Immortal Hulk number 21 is out this week with a very good issue that really fo uh, focuses in on General Fortune and what what's the deal with him, what's his history. It tells his history, it tells his past and all that stuff. So it really makes a lot of sense and brings a lot of the plot back up to date so that we're ready to go even full board. Al Ewing's been doing a great job with this one. Um, this one's got a guest artist on it. It's uh, Ryan Bodenheim and does an excellent job. Ryan Bodenheim from uh, the Jonathan Hickman book, uh, Secret, right? Was that Secret and Dying the Dead? Was that both of them? Anyway, the artwork's cool. The story, though, and what actually happens and how it pushes that momentum forward, I really, really liked it. Immortal Hulk's been bonkers and fun and wild, and I hear that maybe it's wrapping up soon. Have you heard that rumor? I don't know, but they're building up to something big there. Captain Marvel number eight is out this week. This one's got a lot of hoopla behind it right now because it does introduce a new character. I don't know how relevant that character is going to be. I honestly don't think it's going to be that relevant. There is a second printing of this coming, though, if you can't find it. I wouldn't recommend paying too much money for this one. The story's okay. The introduction to the new character is okay. It is a full-on introduction to a way. No origins explained or nothing like that. But I think this is ultimately just going to be a, a little story, one character that just kind of comes and goes. I don't know. But if I wind up being wrong and this book winds up being worth so much money, don't blame me. I'm just saying. The story was okay. It was okay. It was okay. It has not been the strongest Captain Marvel story yet. But I have been generally liking that book. Daredevil number eight is here. Chip Zdarsky's doing such a great book. Such a great job on this book. Daredevil's really, really fun. Even without Chichetto on the artwork, the art is totally fine. Here done by Lalit Kumar Shwarma. Um, really good stuff. Some interesting developments with Kingpin. I really like the scene with Kingpin and the governor. Really like this one. It's basically Matt having dinner with a bunch of known crooks. And it's really, really cool. Very tense. Very wordy and verbose. However, very much... Um, um, just what we've been come to expect from Chip Zdarsky on Daredevil. Really respecting what's come before and doing his own thing to it. Um, really love this Carnage Eyes cover as well. Speaking of Chip Zdarsky, he's got a whole heck of a lot of books out today. Spider-Man Life Story number 5 is out. This is the story about Spider-Man aging in real time. So he started in the 60s here in the 
2000s, he's going to be like what? I don't know, older. Older than he should be, right? What's really cool is that in all of these, they each focus on a decade, and they take not just the current events of that time, but they take what was going on in the comic books at that time. So this one references a lot of the J. Michael Straczynski run, has appearances by Moreland, for instance, and it also references the Civil War, the Marvel Civil War. So really cool stuff. I'm loving this book. Sadarsky, uh, Mark Bagley, what more can you want? I've always wanted to know, and if you're like me, it's always crossed your mind. What would it be like if Spider-Man or the Fantastic Four or Iron Man or the X-Men aged in real life, if we got their whole story and the last like 50 years has been 50 years, what would that story be like? How would it all flow together? That's what Spider-Man life story is and it tells that story excellently. Invaders number seven, also written by Chip Zdarsky, starts a new story dead in the water. So now it's all out there in the open. Namor has drowned a town. All of a sudden, these people, well, these people can all of a sudden, they, they transform into Atlanteans. And so... Namor drowns the town now, so it's kind of like that Sub Diego story from Aquaman, but with a whole lot of baggage about the whole history of the invaders, Namor's post-war traumatic stress, things like that. Of course, Iron Man kind of getting mad at Cap now for allowing it to happen. I've really been liking the character interactions in this book, and Sadarsky understands the history of the Marvel Universe, and he is able to bring it in. He's able to bring in old school stories and ideas and themes and make it work still today and still feel fresh and new. And that's something Sadarsky does great on Spider-Man Life Story, Invaders, and Daredevil. Does it fantastically. Three awesome Sadarsky books out this week. And the X-Men have a lot of endings this week because we're gearing up, gearing up for House of X. Like what, two weeks, something like that? So Age of X-Men, Omega. I read through this one real quick. I kind of stopped paying attention to the Age of X-Men around the issue two or three mark, something like that. Um, and it's, yeah, it's kind of the ending that you think, I mean, the, the natural ending, the ending that it had to have. But if you've been enjoying the age of X-Men, definitely don't miss Omega because it does completely wrap up that story and solve the mystery of the two Dannys in the two realities. Speaking of the two Dannys in the two realities, Uncanny X-Men 22 is here, and this is the final issue of Uncanny X-Men, at least for now, because we're giving everything over to Jonathan Hickman. I couldn't be more excited. Matthew Rosenberg, though, does a great job of bringing all the story threads that he's been working on to a head and once again setting up the X-Men for a place for success in the Marvel Universe. However, who knows what Hickman's going to do, madman that he is. The art makes a very drastic switch here for a few pages towards the end. It gets a little uh, 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 but it has a big X-Men moment that a lot of X-Fans have been waiting for since Grant Morrison's run, I should say. X-Force number 10 is also a final X book out this week. Ed Brisson has done a great job, along with Dylan Burnett and company, of telling the story of Kid Cable. X-Force wanted to kill him at first because Kid Cable came back and killed the old version of himself, which is our Cable, and they got mad about that because our Cable is their Cable as well. In fact, more their Cable than he is our Cable, right? So anyway, this whole story about his explanation why he did what he did, the Young Kid Strife. I absolutely love Young Kid Strife. A nice, satisfying conclusion to the story. I would like to see more about what's going to happen with this character, but I, I almost have a feeling like it's... Hickman's not going to respect and care about any of this, right? I don't know. But it's a nice, satisfying ending to the X-Wars, and I've had a lot of fun with this book. It's not going to change your life. But I've enjoyed it, mostly because I really think Kid Cable's pretty rad, and I want a Kid Cable book, and I want it called Kid Cable. Yeah. I'm not a demanding type person. But speaking of endings, the video is almost over. But first, we got to talk about Unstoppable Wasp number 10. This was the second attempt at the Unstoppable Wasp, and it's once again come to a conclusion. This is the final issue. I have had so much fun with this book. Jeremy Whitley's turned Nadia Pym into one of my absolute favorite characters. And much respects, too, to Alana Smith, the editor of the book, also the editor of the Hawkeye book that I love so much from Kelly Thompson. A lot of my favorite Marvel books that I think are so solid are done by Alana. So she did a fantastic job with this character. So did Jeremy Whitley. So did the artist throughout the series. I'm glad that we got another chance to tell some more stories about Nadia and the Agents of Girl tied in. I really think that Jeremy Whitley told bolder stories in the second volume of The Unstoppable Wasp. I would love to see it come back for a book three, but I'm really excited to see what Jeremy Whitley is going to be doing on Future Foundation coming very, very soon. So to the team, everybody, thank you so much. The Unstoppable Wasp is always unstoppable in my heart. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What you're reading, what you pumped up for, let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for checking out the video. Please do like, share, and subscribe. And join us over at Pop Culture Philosophers for podcasts and a whole lot more. If you want to support financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash PCP. Unlock exclusive content at times. So that could be kind of cool as well. Thank you guys so much for rocking with us. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Keep on reading.